Hi everyone and welcome to this week's Squiggly Careers podcast. I'm Sarah and I'm joined by my co-host Helen. Hi everybody. And as always we're here to discuss all the ins and outs of what it means to have a successful squiggly career, whatever success means to you. And one of the things that success definitely means to us is people listening to the podcast. I mean, anyone, anyone listening, we're pretty grateful for, to be honest, so that we're not sitting here on a Sunday evening just talking to each other. Well, as nice and as that is. As nice as it is, yeah. I think, to be honest, we probably would still do it, wouldn't we? Because we do actually enjoy it that much. But we did have some really big news in the last week, which means we've now reached 100,000 listens in total across all of our podcasts. So we are incredibly Hooray, gosh, grateful. There should have been some fanfare there. I was just listening, yeah. thinking, yeah, woohoo. Oh, yeah, if we had sound effects and knew Damn what we were doing. Like, okay. <laughs> I could have put that on my phone, could I? I totally could have planned that better. If we sorry. were more organised. Uh-huh. Um, and we are so grateful because we are convinced one of the ways that we keep growing is that everyone who listens recommends us to their friends, family, even I think at times random strangers that people meet <laughs> who are saying, oh, you should definitely listen to this podcast. So thank you so much. Uh, Please do keep sharing it, reviewing it, recommending it, because it does mean that we can keep doing it, we can share it even more. And it is one of the things that success means to us is helping as many people as possible with their squiggly careers. And we love hearing all of your stories. So what a lovely way to start this week's podcast. Absolutely. And so this week's topic is about switching off and slowing down. I think this was prompted by the fact that both Helen and I have had a couple of days off in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, I think I slowed down. I think you switched off, probably. Yes, actually, yeah, that's probably true. So the way that we're defining the two, though I think most people will probably kind of get there pretty quickly, we think of switching off as being able to switch off from work, whether that's in the evenings, weekends, holidays. And slowing down, I think, is more about recognising the advantages and the benefits of the different pace of having a different pace of work and kind of how useful and productive it can be to sometimes just slow down to not always be going at 100 million miles an hour to kind of take a breath to reflect and so we thought those two things feel really intertwined and so we're going to talk a bit about both why we think they're important in a squiggly career kind of start with that talk about how good we think we are or not at both of those things and then our ideas based on lots of things that we've read about how you can do both better. So Helen you've done your usual amazing research over the (laughs) last week in terms of why it's so important so what what have you found out in your studies this week? Well in my studies this week (laughs) about why we need to switch off and slow down I found out that 69% of us are regularly required I thought that was an interesting word required to work outside their official hours I'm actually surprised it's not more but basically the majority of us are working outside of our contracted hours which makes it harder to switch off particularly if there is a requirement there maybe like an expectation from other people at work. I also found an interesting bit of research that scientists claim that we now sleep between one to two hours later less than we did 60 years ago so Mm. um for whatever reason it is actually it didn't actually go into the exact detail of why it is that you know they couldn't attribute it directly to the fact that we now work more but i thought that was interesting like if you keep going through like every 60 years and we're sleeping one to two hours less every 60 years what happens in like (laughs) what happens in a couple (laughs) of hundred years are we just like these kind of robots that are awake all the time maybe so because another bit of research i found from my old employees microsoft said that actually the internet age has left us with a much reduced attention span apparently even shorter than a goldfish which i don't quite believe i think it's a no surely not i mean i'm gonna give myself more credit than a goldfish surely (laughs) or perhaps i'm just not giving the goldfish enough credit who knows i am i've been definitely picking up on some words in what i was reading it said research by microsoft suggested i was like (laughs) yeah i'm not sure it's actually really granular research but i did think isn't that interesting we are sleeping less we are working more outside of our contracted hours and our attention span is shorter than it has ever been partly due to technology and when i looked into some of the implications of this um some research by some psychologists has said that inadequate psychological recovery i.e an inability to actually disconnect from the work that you're doing has been linked to a range of different health problems cardiovascular disease so heart disease fatigue negative mood sleep disturbance so loads of these things obviously cause mental health challenges stress like nothing good is coming from from this stuff (laughs) apart from maybe more work but I'm not sure that balances against all of this stuff so I think when we talk about squiggly careers and squiggly careers are full of opportunities because there's much more diversity and freedom and movement and fluidity and opportunities 
opportunity and all that kind of stuff. Squiggly careers are also typified by this. There's more work, there's more always on. Technology is um, shaping the way that we work in ways that I think can be unhealthy unless we find a way to take control of it. And even as you were talking, I was thinking about you saying, you know, potentially there's more work, but that's not the same as, I suppose, better work. Yes. Um, And actually, if you look at things like productivity, particularly for the UK, you know, we're one of the least productive European countries, I think the latest McKinsey study found. Mm. And so, again, just because you are, there's this thing, isn't there, of like, oh, if you're working more hours, there's an assumption that must be better or you must be doing more. But I think there's a real challenge now that I think more and more people are talking about is like, okay, but are you doing more of the right things? Mm -hmm. Are you actually, are you getting to better outcomes? Because if you're not, then actually it just feels like we're doing loads of things that are not good for us and actually not good for anyone else either. So should we start by reflecting on how good we are at both of these things? Because I think they're fresh off your holiday. (laughs) Yeah, easier said than done. Yeah, so I had the typical um, one week holiday, and then I'm one week back into work. And you know, when you always go back in that first day, you're full of so many like good (laughs) resolutions. I always think actually it's one of the things that I might I might write a blog about at some point that as a manager if you're ever managing teams or people you should definitely make sure that you talk to somebody when they come back from holiday (laughs) because I think people often have got the time and space on holiday to think about just more generally their job are they enjoying it what they want to do and so I think if you're smart you try and make sure you have that conversation quite quickly (laughs) don't you kind of don't don't wait for it to kind of be don't wait to be pounced on So what do I think in terms of slowing down versus switching off? So switching off, I think I'm not very good at this during the week. I think in the week, I I feel like actually I am pretty always on. Even if I'm doing something of an evening, let's say I go to an exercise class or something, almost like the minute I would come out of that, if I'm being really honest, I'll be back on my phone really quickly, like Mm. checking messages, checking what's happening. I think I've got a lot better at switching off at weekends since having a baby. You know, when you've got actually somebody else to entertain and look after on a weekend, you almost don't have any choice yes. but to switch off. It's, I've tried it. It's very difficult to combine a toddler and work. Inevitably, it ends up with, you know, your laptop getting broken, which very nearly happened to me quite recently. I think that's forced me to get better at weekends. And actually on holiday is probably when I'm at my best in terms of switching off. I usually have a 24 hour transition period where I just almost need to suddenly get used to kind of the change of pace letting go a little bit of the things that have been on your mind and the projects and I think that's a I definitely feel like there's this almost like weaning off process however I was trying to be super realistic and very honest I was thinking about the last two holidays there's often one project or one thing that's happening that I don't let go of Mm. so to be very honest when I was in Wales there was one thing that was happening where I sort of asked somebody, can you actually send it to me? It was a film that we were making. Can you send it to me on WhatsApp? Because I want to see it while I'm on holiday. Now, if I reflect on that in hindsight, did I add loads of value by seeing that or was it really necessary? Probably not. I mean, I made it. I made a couple of tweaks. I like to think I added some value. <laughs> but, you know, in the scheme of things, it probably didn't really matter. And that's much more, I think, about my, my kind need. of need for control. Yeah. But I think... In the week, definitely not great. Weekends, actually loads better. Holidays, actually, I I do feel like in the main I do switch it off. Slowing down is something that I actually think I really value. So I think I have got a lot better at this actually over the last three or four or five years as I've sort of understood myself better. So I'm a really kind of strategic, planned, reflective person. That's me at my best. And that doesn't necessarily correlate with somebody who is super reactive always kind of frantic or doing everything very quickly I like to think things through I like to think things over and you know the kind of the 24-hour test or the kind of overnight test I take quite seriously because I often think I make better decisions as a result of just giving myself a bit of time to mull things over I think probably at times I'd have the opposite problem of maybe thinking about things like too much but certainly in terms of work rhythms I'm very conscious of If I have a week where, let's say I'm on stage a lot or doing lots of workshops for Amazing If, so you're very on in front of people, almost like publicly in front of people, you're doing a lot of talking and you're not getting much time to think or to listen, I very consciously manage my diary to then try and give myself breaks where maybe I'm spending a bit less time with other people or in quieter environments or just on work that needs 
a longer periods of time and a bit more thinking. So I actually, I do credit myself with knowing now that there needs to be almost like after every period of things going really quick, which I actually also enjoy. I like the adrenaline that I yeah. get from that. I know that I need the slowing down bits because that's where I get my ideas and that's where I get my space. And I think I've noticed that that has been kind of over the last five years as I've perhaps got more accepting of being an introvert and what that means and get and almost where got to learn things like to come yeah, from and how you refuel, yeah. And get better at things like using my strengths. And I think that has come with then knowing that like for example, I know that this next week coming up I've got quite a lot of things where I need to be you know, I'll publicly be talking to lots of people and like, pitching for big bits of work. I will then think about the start of next week and can I just manage my time and my diary to just give myself a, like a small little these don't have to be big things this could even just be like a couple of hours or a day mm. so I think I'm better at that probably than I am the switching off one I'll start with slowing down I think I'm all right at slowing down actually but I, rec- I bet a lot of people if you're listening to this and know me you'll be like no you're not Helen even so I'll be thinking no you're not but because <laughs> I think a lot of people see me as like always on what have I been called that relentless, <laughs> relentless. <laughs> did I call oh, you that was that someone no, else no I've heard it like a few times <laughs> but I think a lot of people see me as being very always on and I think it's because I do have bags of energy so that when I am on like whether it's like delivering course or speaking at events or doing things for us when I'm visible I'm very like energetic but actually I I'm very conscious of the need to slow down so we've been quite busy with Amazing If and last week I've tried to I've basically known that from about April onwards I would have a period of time that I could slow down so I've been very conscious about the rhythm of our work and I've seen when it's been at a, it's sort of when it's peaked and when I could almost like peaks and pauses a little bit more and how mm. that you proactively take advantage of some of those pauses. Sorry if you can hear scratching in the background. My cat is in the room and seems to be having an absolute field day uh, in this room. <laughs> um, she's like, she's obviously disagreeing with me. But yeah, so I would say I am very aware of the rhythms of work. I recognise that sometimes when you have a big project on that that takes quite a lot out of you and I know that I then need to recoup that back. So good at managing that and we can talk about different ideas we've got for how you slow down. I'm pretty rubbish, I think, at actually switching off, though. And actually, that's whether it's on holiday, I really struggle. Or I switch off at the weekend because I've got two young children. It's a similar situation to Sarah with children don't really give you a choice. But... I probably don't mentally switch off. It's almost like, yeah, I have to switch off because I have to make sure they're like not running into roads and, you know, they're eating and they're... Health and that. safety reasons. Health, health and safety. <laughs> and obviously I love my family and blah, blah, blah. Put that caveat in. But I also think I'm my <laughs> brain is often still on a project or a to-do list or something that I think, oh, I've, you know, I've got to be doing that. So I actually do struggle to switch off. And um, I'm going on holiday in, oh, about three or four weeks. And actually part of the holiday is going on, on a Disney cruise and like I know various things are quite expensive on this Disney cruise including Wi-Fi um and so the rest of my family oh, really it's not yeah, free no it's not free it's super expensive and so the rest of my family were going with my um husband my children my in-laws they're like well obviously no one's going to pay for Wi-Fi because you know we don't need it for a week and I was like yes we do <laughs> because I actually <gasps> maybe feel... that could be it maybe no, you could try no, a week without Wi-Fi no I can't this is the thing this is why what I say because well a a way that I relax would be by like watching TED Talks or You could by... download them before you go. Oh yeah, but it's then like number one value of freedom, Sarah. I can't do it. I don't think I can do it. Excuses. <laughs> <laughs> don't growth mindset me on this. Like <laughs> I think we should get all of our like Instagram followers oh, and people listen to the podcast stop, to tell you all the reasons stop. why you don't need Wi Fi for a week and how you could like you know, good little hacks to kind of get over having everything that you need. I don't think I would find this life affirming. I think I would find it life irritating. If people have got a good enough reason of how I can like wean myself off Wi-Fi, I just like, why though? Why? Because it just means that you, you've kind of got everything that you need right there. You don't have all of the incoming or the notifications. It would just get, it's that digital detox thing. You could take a digital detox five days. Oh, God. We're going to have to talk about this after the podcast. (laughs) (laughs) So as you can see, in, in short, Okay, it's slowing down because I think I'm very in control of that and I plan for it. Switching off fills me with a sense of dread, if I'm honest. <laughs> Hilarious. Oh, I really like that. I really oh, like how uncomfortable stop it makes you. Well. It does. It actually makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> 
So we tried to collate. I will move us on because I can sense how uncomfortable Helen's getting. But we won't <laughs> let her off the hook. Don't worry. I, I won't forget. I never forget these sorts of things. But we have collated five ideas that we think have helped us and that we've seen help other people with both slowing down and switching off. All things that we think you can do for yourself, including kind of some of the reasons why these things work particularly well. So the first one is about working in 90 minute stints. So this is about really more slowing down rather than kind of switching off in terms of the two different areas. And there's so much work that shows that essentially the almost like rhythm of our energy within our bodies, the way that we work every day, we sort of have these like 90 minute loops where after every 90 minutes we need to stop and take a break and do something different and actually so many people are in either back-to-back meetings or meetings that last for way more than 90 minutes there is no way that people can kind of be effective when you're working for kind of more than 90 minutes at any one point in time and actually it's something that we've known for quite a long time and it's why we plan all of our workshops in 90 minute stints so we always do 90 minutes and then we always do a break even if it's just for 15 minutes now I was thinking about this and I was thinking it's okay saying this, but lots of people won't feel in control of their days, mm. won't feel in control of their diaries. So I was thinking, okay, so what do you do if you're thinking, well, that's all well and good, but in my organisation, there's lots of two hour meetings or, mm. you know, I just, I get told which things I need to go to. I think I would start by thinking about the things that you can control and think about what you can also do within your team. So I'd kind of go closest to home first. And actually, I was talking to somebody recently and he was saying how they try different kind of work hacks out for three months at a time just to see, do they have any impact in terms of the effectiveness and general happiness of his team? And I thought that was a really good idea. So one of the things that you could say, you know, if you currently have a team meeting that's two hours, you could be as straightforward as going, should we try having that meeting for 90 minutes? And then actually just try giving ourselves half an hour after that where you could perhaps just be getting a cup of tea or just chatting to people and just see what that does to kind of the energy of the people, of the room, the quality of the meeting. And actually, one thing that I found really interesting in one of the bits of research that we'll post in the resources was they were looking at people's presence when they worked in more of these kind of 90 minute focus periods of time. And they found that beforehand, when people were just sort of going through all of these meetings and working really kind of long, unorganised ways for long stretches of time, actually people weren't particularly present, their contributions weren't that positive or weren't actually that useful. But when they were doing everything in these kind of 90-minute sprints, actually, even though they were spending sometimes less time with people, the quality of that time was so much higher. Mm. So it was almost like the quality of that person, they reported back that they felt loads better, their well-being, and they felt like they were performing better. But also the people around them also felt like they were doing a way better job. So almost like everyone was benefiting, mm. everyone was performing better. So I was thinking, probably for most of us, we have at least some control over our time. And you could just start by doing it kind of in your own day or with your own team. And then I think you could perhaps even work together because I was thinking actually one of the ways that I could also do this was working with other members of the people that I work with to think, okay, well, could we rotate who tends different meetings? Do all meetings necessarily need to happen? Can you diarise 90 minute periods of time when you're actually using it to plan or to think? So actually you just start to think slightly more creatively maybe about what those 90 minutes need to contain. It doesn't always need to be a 90 minute meeting. You don't necessarily have to be with somebody else for that 90 minutes. And I was with um, UK TV last week and I heard a really good principle that they had done that I thought was great. I actually had quite a few different things that they were doing. I'm very happy to talk about them. Um, but one of the things was they wanted to implement a meeting free Friday. Um, yeah. And so if you imagine instead of a meeting free Friday, it's a meeting principle of 90 minute max. And then, you know, there's always some kind of break. So you've got some principles about your meetings. But what they had recognised, they agreed this as a, a sort of a leadership team of um, I don't know, about 18 people that all managed other people, but that actually this would be a thing that was beneficial for the team to have one day a week when they weren't going to have meetings. But they recognised that actually some of those meetings get put into their diaries from other stakeholders outside yep. of their direct function. And so what the head of the team had done is talk to some of the heads of the other functions and said, 
basically what they were trying to do and could they support them in trying um, like a period of time to see if they could make this work and I just thought that was a really a they've got a principle that they said about the team hack thing they've got a principle that they talked about as a team and thought would help them but then they'd also had a big reality check of in order for this to work we need people outside of just those people on in our team sort of to work with us on this and they'd had a really it just felt like a really it's quite Sensible, pragmatic, isn't pragmatic it? conversation yeah. with like key stakeholders and I think maybe if you want to put principles like the 90 minute meeting in place then actually thinking about who are your stakeholders who could support it or actually derail it you could have a sensible conversation with them and, and potentially again position it as a trial so they think oh I could never have that two-hour meeting that mm. I really wanted now like position it as a trial and talk about you know what the benefits you think you might see and then talk to them after three months about what's actually been seen but yeah that was a nice idea they also had mistake meetings which i loved at uk tv where they where oh. they openly talk about the mistakes that they have made and have a really open culture which i thought was oh. also brilliant yeah that is do you know what? i'm i'm a big fan of asking the question what mistakes have you made this month to yourself and to the people that you work with and i so i love that idea because i think it's actually really brave in a lot of companies to be able to openly talk about mistakes and i think just actually the freedom to do that would encourage people to just move quickly from focusing on the mistake to focusing on the learning mm-hmm. and that's what i always think the mistakes like everybody makes mistakes actually the most beneficial thing you could do is move people quickly onto going okay that didn't go well fine what did you learn what are you going to do differently um so that's a lovely idea yeah, and i think i recognize within um probably most of the ideas we're going to talk about the kind of the situational context that you find yourself in will impact what you can do and the way you can do this so for something like you know 90 minutes as being kind of a, a good window before you need to take a break that will really depend on the kind of organization you're in we've both worked in really big organizations where some days this would definitely have been impossible to do particularly you know, I've worked in kind of retail organizations where if you tried to do this on a Monday it would have just been impossible I don't think any of these things are suggestions where you're trying to make then everything perfect yes. all of the time yeah but what it might be is that if I think back to when you worked in retail Monday was always really really busy really full on but what you could then do is recognize that actually the first 90 minutes on of a Tuesday you might want to always keep free just to take a breath slow down a little bit, reflect on what happened the day before, what you need to do, make sure you're prioritising for the week ahead. I think something as simple as that could make a really big difference then to your week. We've actually just done it at the creative agency I work at where we've moved our kind of weekly senior meeting from a Monday to a Tuesday, where I think everybody just recognised on a Monday, actually people are in quite a reactive mode there's quite a lot happening all at the same time. And actually the meeting that we have is quite a, it's more of a strategic longer term meeting. And so actually you didn't need to be on a Monday. And mm. almost you were just adding to everybody's stress and pressure by having it. Somehow there's something about like it has to be on a Monday. Well, mm. why, does it, why does it have to be on a Monday? So a lot of this really, I mean, we're suggesting the 90 minute thing because I think that does work and it does show that people's performance does trail off after that 90 minutes. But really I think slowing down is more about recognising that there is a lot of benefits in slowing down and managing your own work rhythms as much as you can in a way that kind of works for you but also works for your organisation. So let's move on to tip number two then. And tip number two, I feel like I sound like a a parent or a manager, but it's to take your holiday, everybody. Take your holiday. (laughs) So you can't... sounds like a really great thing to say. (laughs) You can't really switch off if you're not taking your holiday. And apparently the average worker fails to use six days of paid leave each year. Um, And Ernst & Young did some research on this and they found that for every 10 hours of time taken off from the business, employees' annual performance ratings improved by 8%. I do wonder whether there's a tipping point. I feel like I'm critiquing every piece of research here. I do wonder, like, if you took off like like half a year, whether your performance would still improve by eight percent. But mm. it did say that basically, you know, you need to use your holiday. You are more your your performance is higher when you have used your holiday. And so actually, not taking those six days, you have earned it. You are you are right for it. I do wonder why people don't take those days. And it didn't go into that because I think maybe for some people it is about belonging maybe it's about uh, actually they want to be at work because it's a sense of belonging maybe for some people it's about pressure maybe it's for some people they've forgotten to plan something so it's almost like well I'm not got anything better to do so I may as well work I'm sure there's a whole host of reasons but I think I don't know some people are planners some people are spontaneous but you were entitled to that holiday and there's a you know the research proves that actually if we take that holiday we are better in our job so I guess for the people that are thinking 
oh, you know, I've got to stay at work because my job is so reliant on me and I've got to stay fit. Any of it's any of that mindset is going on, then the research is kind of counter to that because the research says you'll actually be better at your job and more impactful if you do take that break. I also think, and I have seen this before and perhaps have even fallen into this trap a few times myself, if you're thinking you can't go on holiday because your organisation or your team is reliant on you and on you specifically and they can't cope without you going on holiday, you know, for a week, maybe two at the most. Most people don't go on holiday for more than two, most of the time, two weeks. Actually, that's a different problem, I think. I think the problem there is that you have created, you know, a system or a structure whereby you've got too much kind of almost like tacit knowledge within one person's head. And if people can't cover for you within a week or a two-week period that is a really good prompt for you to think, okay, well, why not? It might be just that you've inadvertently become an expert on something and there's maybe not enough experts around you and you can actually start to think creatively about, okay, so what do I need to help other people to learn? What do I need other people to know? They probably don't need to know all the ins and outs of things, but how do I make sure that somebody would know enough so that when I go on holiday, people are not panicking or actually it puts a load of stress and strain on other people when I go away. And it, it kind of it does sound a little bit negative, but I do think this is always true. It's like no one is indispensable. It doesn't matter who you are or how senior you are or what job you've got. Most organisations are based on teams of people all kind of working together. And I have seen this a few times before where you could see people thinking, oh, but if I'm not here, everything's going to fall down. And mm. it's actually quite a good reality check for us all to realise that that's not true. I'd planned to go on a really big holiday because I plan all my holidays because I'm a planner. And I was going on a really big holiday to South Africa that I was really excited about. And it happened to fall in the middle of a really big project I was doing at Sainsbury's. And I hadn't known at the time that those two things were going to coincide. And I remember feeling really awful that I was going. And I I knew I was going to be out of contact for quite a lot of it as well. So it wasn't like I was going to be able to really do any work. It wasn't that kind of holiday. I was like travelling around to different places. And so I just knew that I was going knew that I probably did know some things that other people didn't. And actually, it really forced me to make sure I was sharing my knowledge and my learning with other people. And then, you know, like, funny enough, you go and you come back and, like, some things are actually better. (laughs) You're like, okay, well, they've sort of come up with a better idea than perhaps I had. Or sometimes, actually, it's for someone, maybe there was a gap or there's something you've forgotten to tell someone about, and they've just figured it out. People are smart and they've figured out a solution or they've come up with whatever their best concept or idea is at that time and usually that's absolutely fine I've seen that a few times and probably been slightly nervous about it myself though I would say I am somebody I do always take my holiday have you ever not taken your holiday I don't know I don't I think I'm pretty good at taking holiday Mm, I think Um, I am I think I yeah and particularly with Amazing If as well, because we've always had to take That's holiday true. to do our Amazing If on top of yeah. like holiday for family time. <laughs> Does that so count as holiday? <laughs> yeah, over the last five years, I've definitely, and, I, and I've bought holiday as well. So yeah, actually, yeah, yeah I've, I've definitely used it. Um, shall we move on to number three? Let's, so number three, which is, I think, to help support mainly slowing down, but will also help a bit, I think, with switching off, is start to ask why. And ask why constructively. I think it's uh, important to kind of add to this. So this is not just about asking why you're spending time on something or why you're doing a project. It's really about making sure that you're really clear for yourself about why you're spending time on different things, focusing on the things that matter most. And I do see this a lot, actually. I think it's a trap that everybody kind of falls into is this whole thing of um, being busy all the time. And I think people within squiggly careers sometimes it's like a bit of a badge of being busy that's almost like a badge of honor and actually I wonder if and I sort of hope that over time it will also be a really good thing to say oh yeah I'm I'm sort of slowing down a little bit this week but I'm taking some time to reflect or I'm taking some kind of time out to I don't know read a book or do something a bit different and the question I think it's more important to ask yourself is rather than going are you busy think am I delivering value Am I succeeding? Whatever kind of success looks like to you. Yeah, I'm at my best. And actually to be even more specific, um, one of the things that I really liked when I was reading about slowing down and almost like thinking about are you spending your time well is just for every month just thinking, so what is like the one thing at work that I really want to achieve this month? Because I think you can be so busy doing so many different things that actually it's, it's not that difficult to get to the end of the month and think, have I actually delivered some one Isn't thing that, that I'm really, really proud of yeah it is it's almost like you've done the exact opposite you know like we were talking about you're working more and more hours 
but are you always achieving more and more? Probably not. Mm. And we've done this a bit more, I think, with Amazing If for this year, where, you know, Amazing If has always been quite meandering. We've gone in lots of different directions and explored lots of things, which has always been really great for us. But we are both definitely, you know, people who'd be like busy, quite busy people doing lots of things. And we find it really easy to add things on, but really difficult to take things away. Mm -hmm. And and we're kind of, we're both, we're both really bad for that. And so what we really tried to do at Christmas was actually to be really specific about for this year, if we only had to have three things, what would they be? If we only had to have one thing for the year, what would it be? And I have found, because I keep that starred at the top of my Mm -hmm. um, like desktop almost, every time I open my web browser, I've got a starred thing that says 2019 priorities. (laughs) It's funny, when I keep going back to that, it just really helps me every month to just think about, am I spending my time delivering value? Am I succeeding? Or am I just busy for the sake of it? And it just helps you to continually recalibrate. I always think you should know why you are doing anything. If somebody came up to you and said, oh, so why are you working on that? Why are you spending this hour and a half doing this thing? Why are you spending this week in this way? Can you actually answer those questions in a way that is compelling and makes sense to you and to others and I think just by doing that it helps you to prioritize better and helps you to then almost kind of slow down when you need to speed up when you need to I think it's easier to manage your work rhythms when you're prioritizing better I personally think there's a really strong correlation between the two things yeah and I think what worked for us this year is we we did a big why like what is it we are really we trying did, to yeah, achieve we did. and then we brainstormed just in case this process helps other people we got post-it notes and we had like every what we wanted to do so we spent like <laughs> okay what's our big why what's our big why and, and we had clear, like there were there were ridiculous like, there amount were a of lot notes. of post-it notes <laughs> ridiculous amount. it wasn't like we started in a good place <laughs> yeah there were a lot but then we then looked at all of the what's that we'd written down on each of these individual post-it notes in the context of the why if that makes sense of what we wanted to achieve this year and we together then prioritized and said okay well all of that clusters into you know the organizations we want to work with to make an impact or all of this clusters into how we can reach more people and it enabled us to take your sort of 30 40 post-it notes which are basically just like a list of things you wanted to deliver and have a really good view of well how do these all link together in the context of the why we doing amazing if this year what's our big why this year and therefore what's the prioritization so just in case it helps people like work out why you're doing what you're doing what's your big driver write out all the different tasks activities and projects and stuff that is kind of like exciting to you and you might want to do but then prioritize them in the context of kind of your why where it's working for us really well so. yeah it is Um, So number four then is about finding absorbing leisure activities. So this is in the context of yeah, either (laughs) either slowing down or switching off. Actually, I think it applies to either of them. But there was um, a study by someone called Professor Cropley in 2013 of 300 different workers, and found in that study that the people that who valued and spent time on their leisure time and also scheduled activities that they enjoyed were more able to detach from work. And another part of the study that I thought was quite interested was that the most effective way of detaching from the work was to find a leisure activity that was the total opposite of your work, which is quite interesting for me because I think okay. amazing. Yeah, it was basically saying that um, they talked about this example of accountants and um, for accountants who look at their screen all day, for example, one of the most um, effective leisure activities for them would be something like cycling home because it's completely different from what they would have been doing all day. You have to be very conscious of the traffic around you. Um, and they did a study on uh, cycling commuters and they said that 89% of them said that cycling helped them to switch off from their working day so they basically in the research it's find a hobby that is the very different to what you're spending your working time doing which for me was interesting because what I consider my hobbies is probably quite late related to work so when I talk about you know oh I but I like to watch TED talks to relax and I like to read career books (laughs) that's sort of my job (laughs) so I maybe need to find I don't know paint painting or something something that's a bit different anyway I don't I think I do um I think this is true but then you're good yeah, I was just talking to Helen actually before we started the podcast about Parkrun. So for those of you perhaps who aren't in the UK or you've not heard of Parkrun before, it's um, a free run that you can do on a Saturday morning all over the country and it's 5k. So you don't have to be an amazing runner. There are people there who I think, I swear are in their 80s and 90s, all beating me. There are people there with triple boogies who are beating me <laughs> doing this run. It's amazing to watch. Loads all run by volunteers and it's brilliant. But one of the reasons I do that other than, you know, obviously just generally to stay fit, is, as Helen said, I like the fact that it's just 
with a load of people who is nothing to do with work. You don't know anyone. No one's going to talk to you about work. And it's such a, for me, it's a really hard physical activity that all I'm spending that 5K thinking about is trying to put the next step in front of the next one and keep going and not stop. I really admire you for doing it. I think it's really good. And it takes a lot of mental energy. Well, crikey, there are people who do way better, like you know, physical things than that. But it's, but I yeah, do. But you make... got up on a, like at the weekend yeah. to do it with a young child and then fit it into your day. It's really good. It's really good. But I, the reason I, the thing I find whenever I do anything like that where it is quite different is, you know, you just think I just always feel better. I really believe in that kind of relationship between when you're mentally and physically just generally feeling better from doing, and it's because you have all your nice positive endorphins, etc. I know then I'll be better at work mm. and I've seen it and I've seen it time and time again and particularly at the start of this year where we spent a lot of time and still spending a lot of time writing our book and I'm really mindful of that's quite a solitary activity. Mm. There's a lot of time in front of your screen. Every day before I do that, I will try and like go for a run or I'm getting quite into like yoga videos on YouTube. Adrienne, um, she's good. Yes. Yoga with yeah, Adrienne. Yeah, yeah, that's my favourite one because she's, she's quite accessible. She's a dog annoying. with her. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, just I do them fine. I'm like, I just know that the work will be better as well because I'm motivated by that being better. So I, I like the idea of it being opposite. We'll have to think of one mm. for you. So, so far, I feel like your actions are, one, digital oh, detox for the week. Oh, Two, finding some interesting activities that aren't work. <laughs> Why has this podcast become about me? <laughs> I'm absolutely I think loving good. it. I think there are some good lessons in this podcast for me. And I, 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 <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of stepping towards taking them. <laughs> you might have to convince me over the next week. Um, Should we talk about the last one yes. and see whether you're doing this one? Uh, so number five is daydreaming. I've seen a lot of articles over the last couple of weeks on daydreaming. So perhaps it's having a little bit of a resurgence or a moment. But certainly the research that we looked at was 2017. So only a couple of years ago. And he did a really interesting article that's kind of summarised on The Independent around, actually, if we have time to daydream, so if our brain is given the space almost to just wonder and meander freely, it actually increases your brain capacity. So your brain can then work faster and you then avoid distraction better. So almost like by giving your brain that freedom to just think whatever it wants to think, then almost when you then get to work, you're working better and probably more present and focused as we were kind of talking about in one of the other tips. And I've seen quite a few people who write about it specifically in relation to commuting. You know, and one of the things that we would often say is like, you know, if you use your commutes to mm. read, listen to brilliant podcasts like ours, <laughs> etc. You know, you can use your commute for lots of kind of good activities. I've read quite a few articles recently where people are saying, that's all great, but sometimes you might just want to use your commute to just look out the window. Mm. Um, particularly if you're you not know, if you're driving, obviously concentrate on the road. But you know, if you're on a train, literally just to watch what's going past you. And do you know what I thought then? I was thinking, I cannot remember and I go on a train every day into central London. I can't remember the last time I just looked out the window. Like I can't even tell you what is out that window because, you know, I would sit with my head down either working or looking at my phone or or listening to a podcast. And so I do actually just allow myself to do that a little bit more. There's just been something that's kind of twigged in me that goes, actually, you know, if I'm particularly tired or just feel like I just need a bit of a break or maybe I've got a particular hard problem that I'm trying, a knotty problem I'm trying to think through, actually rather than just delving into something or trying to answer loads of emails, perhaps just thinking I'm just going to sit on the train for 35 minutes and just look out the window and think mm. about stuff is quite interesting, especially then related to the fact you're then I then walk home. I often find sometimes that thing of like sitting and thinking and then walking, having a bit of physical exercise, does then sometimes mean that by the time I got home I have thought about something or a new idea or a new a new way of thinking through something that I was finding quite tricky. I think I probably do a little bit of it. I don't I wouldn't say I'm brilliant at it, but I um I'm a lover of a bath for 90 minutes. And in the bath... 90 tend, minutes? Yeah, I know, really long time. I think, I feel like I wait till the kids are in that bed. Is a lot, you must be very shrivelly. Oh, yeah, probably, I think I probably have. <laughs> I keep topping up with really hot water. Um, but I, that's probably like my time. Like, I don't talk to anybody else. I'm just in there. That's like... Do you look at your phone? Um, no, not really. No, Helen, I just... No, not really. It, like, a, no. like a bit, like, because it's 90 minutes, so I'm a bit like, oh, anything could have happened. <laughs> so, but no, but um, I'll have it there, but I don't generally look at it. I'm, sometimes I read, sometimes I just sort of, yeah. sort of splash around a little bit. But I think that's probably... Um, Your the, daydreaming time. Yeah, that's I nice. think so. And then I was also thinking about the train thing. I went to Sweden earlier this year, and um, we had this amazing train journey where... 
like outside it was just white which sounds like a very boring it was very snowy um but we were just driving like through forests and i and i guess it it was so white and so snowy and so different to what i normally see when i look out of trains windows when i'm going into london that i was just sort of struck by it and honestly for like about an hour i just looked out of the window for ages and i was just thinking gosh it's really beautiful and i don't know i don't really know like daydreaming i don't really know if i daydreamed but i definitely just let my mind wander and appreciate hmm. what I was looking at without having any intention of coming up with any ideas or you know any yeah. kind of worky thoughts I think I would suggest the thing here that is that there's some potentially so much pressure on almost like productivity using every last second to like the nth degree to trying to do something that almost giving yourself permission to daydream and almost finding what feels right for you in terms of when might you do some daydreaming Sometimes it is when people are going for a walk. But yeah, even the other, I was thinking this the other day, I was thinking, I can't remember the last time I walked without my headphones in. I like wear my headphones pretty much all of the time. Usually listening to a podcast, various different kind of ones. And some of those are very much leisure ones rather than work ones. But I, I think because I'd lost my headphones and I was actually really panicky about commuting into London and back without my headphones. But then it probably just encouraged me to just walk and daydream a bit more yeah because like I I didn't have something kind of going on inside my brain or something talking to me so it's just it's just interesting isn't it hack isn't it like an easy daydreaming hack like next time you're walking along take your headphones out take your headphones out yeah leave your headphones (laughs) out who knows what might happen (laughs) (laughs) so as always all of the links to the articles that we've referred to and actually a few extra ones that we looked at while we were planning for this week's podcast a really good one from at Harvard Business Review on managing your energy and not your time nice. that's really useful and that has lots of links to other podcasts and the other one that I really liked was slightly more about leadership but about kind of being present as a leader and that's the one where they taught specifically like about before and after where before they were kind of acting in one way they tried being more mindful kind of changing their behavior and just how positive the impact was on both themselves and the people around them I found fascinating you know when you sometimes think oh yeah these things all sound really great but do they actually make a almost like a tangible concrete difference it sounds like and the this... sort of article you might you know sometimes when you have a manager that isn't always the best manager but yeah. a frantic manager yeah. you're like do i how how do i how send do I? this article <laughs> yeah that's where my suggestion in that in that instance would always be like share it with the team team, team. <laughs> it's always very useful I'm that's what you. the team's for uh, so as always, thank you so much to everybody for listening today. As we said at the start, uh, we're really grateful for all our listeners. Please do continue to share it. Give us feedback. And if there are any topics or anything you'd like us to cover that we've not, uh, please do let us know. We definitely kind of take requests, which I always think makes us sound like a radio show. <laughs> please do follow us on Instagram. We're just at Amazing If. Uh, you can direct messages with any ideas you've got for the podcast. And we always update with kind of what we're up to on Instagram um, and the latest podcasts. All the resources are on our website, www.amazingif.com. And we're on Twitter too, which is just at amazing underscore if. Can I just um, put one little thing out, Sarah, actually? Uh, So an idea that Sarah and I did a little bit of WhatsApping about last week was potentially featuring some of our listeners' best pieces of career advice on the podcast. So it's a bit of a test. We're not kind of 100% sure how it works, but in the uh, spirit of one of our values being work in progress, we would love to see if this would, would work. The way this will work would be if you have got a piece of career advice which is something that we often collate on our courses and we ask people it's also going to be a chapter in the book if you've got a piece of career advice that you has really helped you or has stuck with you and you think might help our audience of over a hundred thousand listeners to the podcast then what we'd love to do is hear from you and what we'd really like is for you to voice record your best piece of career advice so you can just do it on your phone like voice record and then email it to us which is just get in touch at amazing if.com and depending on if we get any and um, what we'll try and do is to put them onto the podcast at the end of the recording so that we will try if we get some and we'll close our podcast out with a best piece of career advice from our audience so all you've got to do record to your voice memo um and then email it to us get in touch at amazingif.com and as i said if we get some um, we'll try and feature them at the end of each episode so we'll how see how we do go. a voice memo i don't even know how you do that other it's than easy on just like go into your search function voice yeah. recorder oh god let me do it right now right i'm on my iphone everybody. i was just thinking live not every- helen is very good at all the kind of techie stuff and i was right. thinking if someone had just said that to me i don't think i would know how to do it right, unless everybody. i was in what's that? live tutorial <laughs> on my phone um so i've got an iphone so i'm not quite sure how this works on android um but on if you've got an iphone all you do is you go to your search bar so that's when you sort of pull it down sarah you know what i mean okay i can teach you, yeah. if you, can see you I'm just and you test. type in voice and voice memo application which is inbuilt into your iphone should come up 
and then it will pop up and then you just record it. There's a little red button, the record button, you record it, it saves it, you email it then, you can select email and you email it to get in touch at amazingif.com. It's pretty easy. I promise. Oh, well, there we go. Good step by step. And so let us know how you get on. So hopefully that feels pretty straightforward to do. And next week, we've got one of our special guest podcasts. So I'm actually going to be talking to a lady called Christine Armstrong, who is the author of a book called The Mother of All Jobs. What I would say, if you're listening to this and not a mum, most of the conversation is not about kind of having kids necessarily. It's much more about what it takes to make everything work in harmony albeit kind of the spoiler is you know no one has it absolutely perfectly or balanced but she's done loads of uh, brilliant research for her book and she does talk about how kind of parenting is changing generally so if you are already a parent or planning to be a parent or even just thinking about being a parent it's certainly a book I wish I'd read like three or four years ago though I'm very glad that I've never read it with a kind of two-year-old with still quite a lot of parenting Mm. left to do because I sort of feel like you know once you're sort of in it they're not not really going anywhere (laughs) so you're pretty committed and Christine is great. She's really fun and kind of funny, but, you know, really kind of takes some of the topics seriously without taking herself too seriously, which I think is really nice. So it will probably be about a 45, 50 minute interview and um, really enjoyed meeting her. And as I did with the Bruce Daisley podcast as well, I do a little book review kind of at the end. And I'm sure we'll get a couple of books to give out on Instagram as well if it's something that you'd like to win. So um, tune in next week for that. So that is it from both of us this week. And we'll be back with you next week. Well, Sarah will, and I'll be back with you the week after. So take care, everyone. Speak to you soon. Bye. Bye, everyone.